also members of Congress, uh, fellow members of the Honoring Our Promises Working Group, group across the political spectrum, uh, that we wanted to um, uh, stand up and let our voices be heard on what's happening and what we think the, the path forward over the next couple of days is. Uh, so before I uh, launch into it, though, I would like to give um, a moment to somebody who's a personal friend, a confidant, and a mentor of mine that has been a voice of reason uh, and a, a voice of wisdom for the United States of America for uh, many decades uh, and a close personal friend of mine. Uh, so it's my honor to start by uh, turning this over to former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Secretary Albright. Thank you. I, I want to thank Representative Pro and his colleagues for organizing this event and for standing with our Afghan friends and allies at this very difficult moment. We've all been watching the tragic and horrific situation unfolding in Afghanistan, and there will be plenty of time to assess how this happened and what went wrong. But our focus today and in the days ahead needs to be squarely on saving lives. In the 20 years that the United States and our partners have been in Afghanistan, a new generation of Afghan leaders has stepped forward to help chart a better future for the country. Their ranks include women's rights activists, independent journalists, anti-corruption crusaders, and democracy advocates. Most of these people did not work directly for the US government or for our NATO allies, but their lives are now imperiled by the Taliban's advance and they need to be evacuated from the country before it's too late. The United States has a moral responsibility and a national security interest in ensuring the protection of these Afghan allies, as well as those who directly supported our military mission. I know the Biden administration recognizes this responsibility. American diplomats and military personnel are working around the clock to secure the Kabul airport and implement the safe and orderly evacuation that the president has directed. This is obviously not a simple undertaking. It requires a Herculean effort, not only by our forces on the ground, but by the entire US government, including both the executive and legislative branches. The commitment and support of Congress has been and will continue to be essential to seeing this mission through as has the active involvement of many NGOs which are represented on this call today. We will also need the support and assistance of other countries which are stepping forward to provide temporary hosting and transit. And I especially wanna recognize our friends in Canada and the Balkans, including Albania, Kosovo and North Macedonia for their generosity and willingness to help. I hope and expect other countries, including the United States and the major Western powers to do their part. Let me just say that even as we work to evacuate those whose lives are directly imperiled by the Taliban, we cannot forget the millions of Afghans, especially women, who risk losing the considerable gains made over two decades of sacrifice. Going forward, the protection of Afghan women must be a top priority, and I will do my part to ensure that it remains at the center of the international agenda. Thank you again, Congressman Poe, for what you are doing and with your colleagues. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you, Secretary Albright. We appreciate your voice, your wisdom, uh, your counsel, and your leadership as always. Uh, I would like to begin just by making a couple of comments and addressing groups that are uh, uh, incredible importance to us right now. One, uh, to the Afghan people, to our partners, to our allies, to those who stood shoulder to shoulder with us over the last 20 years. We see you, we hear you. You have many friends in the United States and we will continue to fight for you and bring you to safety with your families. Uh, that, that is a promise that we will make. You have many allies uh, and that's why we are here today. I also wanna address my fellow veterans. This is a challenging time for US co combat veterans as we grapple with the meaning of the last 20 years and your service and your sacrifice. And I wanna make something very clear. Your service, your sacrifice 
was honorable. You stood up, you raised your right hand, and you served your country when you were called to do so. Uh, and, and you should be proud of that because we are proud of that. Uh, you made a difference in the lives of many people. You saved your brothers and sisters that you stood shoulder to shoulder with, and you will always and should always be proud of that service. And that's always different from the political debates, the policy debates that will happen and have happened, but your indiv individual service was done with dignity, and for that, we are very grateful. As Secretary Albright said, there's gonna be time to have the debate about the missteps and the mistakes of the last 20 years, and there were many. We will have that discussion. We will figure out as a nation, as members of Congress, as a community, uh, what went wrong and how to do it. Uh, and certainly the mistakes of the last couple of weeks and the last couple of days as this very tragic scene unfolds at Kabul International Airport uh, and around the country. But we are here today with a very simple message, and that is keep Kabul Airport open. Send in the combat power and the troops that are necessary to secure that airport and keep it open as long as we possibly can. We have the means, we have the ability, we are the United States of America, we can do this and we can get thousands and thousands of people out, but we must have the will. That is our simple message. And it's a message that you're gonna hear repeatedly from my friends and my allies on this call today. Starting with my friend, Michael Waltz, a former Green Beret, a combat veteran of Afghanistan uh, from Florida. Mike, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I just wanna first off echo exactly- Recording um, in progress. What you're saying uh, that uh, to our fellow veterans, to our Gold Star families, uh, to the Afghan families who are so worried, uh, sick right now about their relatives, 9-11 victims, everyone who sacrificed so much in Afghanistan in the last 20 years for freedom and for democracy. Your sacrifices were not in vain. Uh, many of us are struggling uh, with what's going on, and that is understandable. But, um, but you are not alone. And if you are going to a very dark place, uh, please reach out and get help and speak to someone. This is devastating as we've, as we've said, it's devastating from a human rights perspective. It's devastating for American credibility. Our adversaries and other allies around the world are watching and I think uh, scratching their head, if not terrified uh, about American resolve. Uh, and it's devastating, I think, for future American security as we head into the 20th anniversary of 9-11 uh, with the Taliban flag flying over Kabul, soon to be joined by Al Qaeda 3.0, uh, which I fear will be far worse. But here nor there, uh, uh, Representative Crow is right. Uh, we will have those debates, and I pray we have some accountability uh, for this calamity. Um, today, now, uh, I hope to see a number of things. Number one, the State Department cannot be in the position of giving people a death sentence over typos and the wrong forms. Uh, that The very documentation that people need uh, to, to prove that uh, they stood with us um, is documentation that will get them killed uh, if found in their home or found with it on uh, in, at a Taliban checkpoint. I've personally had that happen to one of my own interpreters who was not uh, just executed. He was taken back to his home and beheaded in front of his family and alongside his brothers and cousins. That's the brutality that we're dealing with and what's at stake. Uh, I, I'm sure all of us who have been so engaged are overwhelmed with pleas and requests from terrified Afghans uh, who stood with us bravely and publicly and have now been left behind. And I know we're all doing whatever we can to help them. But the State Department must continue to streamline this process the Defense Department, uh, I'm calling on the president to authorize them to create safe zones and communicate those zones very quickly uh, and to give uh, the military on the ground the authority that if people cannot get to those safe zones to go get them. Uh, this, we should have never pulled our military assets out. Representative Crow and I in a bipartisan, bicameral fashion have been saying for months now uh, that that when the last American boot went wheels up, that we were handing these people a death sentence. Uh, the boots are now back, and I hope we can correct 
uh, those errors. And then finally, I think we need a very clear message to the Taliban and any country that would seek to recognize this brutal regime that took Afghanistan by force, not by negotiation and not through diplomacy and not by agreement, um, uh, that uh, their brutality will not be tolerated, their marriage with Al Qaeda that seeks to uh, uh, attack the West again will not be tolerated. Uh, and it, it's just phenomenally frustrating, but I wanna, I wanna thank you, Jason, uh, for continuing the stand. And uh, I, for one, am certainly willing to do whatever it takes uh, to get those out that helped us. We need a clear policy, finally, uh, sorry, for how long this air bridge will be open, uh, how many will get out. Um, uh, and then the final piece is the P1, P2 program. Uh, I certainly welcome it, but some of the requirements to get to third countries uh, are just not realistic. There are a number of steps we can make uh, to be far more helpful in line with what we did for the South Vietnamese and for other allies. Get them out now. We have a moral and na national security obligation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was Representative Waltz from Florida. Uh, next, we're going to go to uh, my friend uh, Tom Malinowski from New Jersey. Thank you, uh, Representative Crow, for your leadership on this uh, over the last several months. Thank you. Representative Waltz for being consistent on Afghanistan, no matter who is in the White House. Uh, we all agree here that we have a moral and strategic obligation to help the Afghans who helped us and to help the Afghans who bet their lives on the future that America promised them. The good news is that the administration has accepted that in principle. They have committed themselves to the broadest possible evacuation of people in several categories. First and foremost, obviously American citizens and those who worked for our various missions in Afghanistan, that has to come first, we all acknowledge that. Second, those eligible for the SIV visas, the, the Afghans who, who directly aided our military effort in the country. And third, a broader category of Afghans who are at risk of retribution from the Taliban, everything from women's rights and human rights leaders and journalists and people who were students or faculty at the American University uh, in Afghanistan, many others. Now that commitment has to be operationalized. It's not enough just to make it on paper and to operationalize it, as others have said, first and foremost, we have to fully secure the airport. And second, we have to enable the Afghans who are on our list for evacuation to come to the airport as soon as possible so that they can stage there for as long as it takes before flights can come to pick them up. And if that requires uh, having tents, if that requires MREs, if that requires having a very large number of people on the airport compound for days or weeks, then so be it. Certainly it will require American troops, more troops than we had before President Biden made this decision. Let the irony of that sink in, but that is what is required right now. The reason for this, the reason why we need them to the, at the airport now is because with every pass, passing hour, it is going to become harder for Afghans on our list for evacuation to get to the airport safely. This morning, I heard about a group of Afghan women, including a woman who was on the government's peace delegation in Doha, viciously beaten by the Taliban near the airport. As um, others have pointed out, um, these people are not gonna be able to come to the airport with their passports and their IDs and their application uh, documents for visas. We are going to have to identify them probably based on their telephone numbers. The good news is the State Department has their telephone numbers. They have a list of people who need to be evacuated. We need to start calling those people the moment the airport is secure and bring them there. And then as others have pointed out, make a clear public commitment that we will hold that airport for as long as it takes. The question here is whether this is going to be Saigon or Dunkirk. Are we going to leave people behind as we did in South Vietnam? Or are we going to hold the beach 
until everybody is taken off that beach. I hope that it's the latter and that from that moment, we can begin to rebuild some semblance of American support for the idea that Afghanistan can be a freer and better place and not a haven for people who wish to attack the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Malinowski. Uh, next, we're gonna go to uh, my friend, Representative Peter Meyer from Michigan. Peter. Thank you, Jason, um, for your leadership on this. Thank you, Mike, uh, for those remarks. And then Tom as well. I, I could not agree more with everybody here. Um, the first and foremost priority is securing Kabul airfield. It is getting the American citizens who are there, getting the Afghan nationals who loyally serve this country out to a safe place. Uh, this is an incredibly tense situation. I've been in communication with folks who are at the airfield on both sides, on the civilian side, on the military side. Um, it, is, it is a powder keg. Uh, we need to be doing everything we can uh, as our forces who are there are doing to secure that airfield, to hold it, but also to work through that backlog. You know, as a military veteran, as somebody who lived and worked in Afghanistan for a humanitarian aid organization, uh, you know, I know, and those of us who served over there know, journalists who were in Afghanistan and used interpreters or local fixers, we all have friends and colleagues who are there and are trapped and are talking to, and they are moving around from house to house with their families, trying to avoid getting hunted down by the Taliban. I know for some, this may be an abstraction. Uh, you see a, a glaring, jarring image um, that, is, that is moving, or it's an idea of a, a tragedy far away that, that maybe tugs at the heartstrings. Uh, but for tens of thousands of Americans, for probably over 100,000 Americans, I mean, this tragedy has a face, it has a name, and those faces and names are Afghans who have families who are at risk. So we need to be doing everything we can I don't think there is any disagreement here that Congress is willing to help in any way possible to make sure that this administration holds Kabul airfield, provides our forces with the support that they need, and make sure that we do not end this mission early, that we stay to make sure we fulfill the promises made to those Afghans who supported us, that we ensure uh, we leave taking care of those who stuck their necks out for us, and if anything else, any other conclusion rather than one that keeps our allies safe will be a dark and shameful moment in this country's history. So I'm proud of the bipartisan effort that we have. I'm proud of the work that we did to get legislative solutions around SIVs. Now it's an operational challenge. And to the extent that there is a legislative solution, we stand ready. But otherwise, we need to hold that airfield and we need to get people to safety. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next, we will go to uh, former Congressman Jim Colby uh, from Arizona and currently a board member of the International Republican Institute. Uh, Jim, over to you. Thank you, Representative Crow, and thanks to all the others that have joined on, on this call to talk about what a very important principle and a very important uh, thing that the United States has to do to meet its commitments to the people that helped us in Vietnam. I have a real sense of deja vu about all this because I was very deeply involved in Operation Orphan Airlift from Saigon, where we were trying to evacuate thousands or hundreds of, of, of orphans that had been processed for adoption in the United States, but paperwork hadn't been finished. And it was a helter-skelter operation. And I so, certainly hope that we are able to he, here to stay at the airport and to re, retain control long enough to get the people out that we need to get out. I wanna emphasize particularly that there are others that perhaps we aren't, that haven't been thinking about. And those are people that work for the NGOs like National Democratic Institute, uh, like uh, International Republican Institute and others that are represented on this call today. These people are not initially on the list of people to be, to be taken out. Many of them have been told if they get out of the country, they can process their visas later. But there isn't time to be later. We have to get these people out. They served us in the same way that the interpreter service, those that work for as contractors for uh, the United States agencies and for the military, they served our, us in the same way, helping promote democracy and freedom in their own country. And they, have the, they, they deserve to be protected in this time of need. So I hope that we will be thinking not only of those who directly 
who work for the United States government, but those who work for all the organizations that were helping to trying to build a greater and better Afghanistan, which I know we all hope will be there in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we couldn't agree more and we appreciate your continued leadership. Uh, next, we're gonna go to Rai Barkat, a co-founder of the With Honor organization and a Marine combat veteran. All right. Thanks, Representative Crow, and good to be on with all of you. Uh, with Honor, as many of you know, works with principled veterans from both parties who serve in the four country caucus, including representatives Crow, Meyer, and Waltz, who are on this call. And, you know, we support the agenda that these veterans identify matter for the country. And right towards the beginning of this year, this issue of protecting our allies in Afghanistan, including our interpre interpreters and other allies, was identified. And I got to say, three weeks ago, for the first time, I was starting to feel more optimistic because we saw one of the largest bipartisan votes in Congress in recent years, uh, led by uh, Representative Crow with Meyer, Waltz, uh, Representative Malinowski was on it, 407 votes to 16 to pass the Allies Act. We then saw the beginning of the first evacuation of, of uh, what's to be up to 2,500 uh, Afghan allies. Well, now we have over 50,000 who are in Kabul. And we, as with honor, will continue to convene and lead veteran service organizations and humanitarian organizations and call for the U.S. government and the administration to do everything in our power, not only to protect the Americans, and there are thousands of American citizens in Kabul, but to also honor our promises, honor our commitments to our Afghan allies. And that's our main message for today. Um, we're doing everything in our power. Uh, I encourage uh, anyone that has the means to also think about the long tail of this. There will be thousands of Afghan families who need support. I'm so encouraged to see the commitment by the Open Society uh, uh, Institute, which I believe um, we'll, we'll hear from next. I also see No One Left Behind, which has been part of this coalition that we've built to support Representative Crow and others uh, with our veteran service organizations and our humanitarian organizations. No One Left Behind is an organization that's doing really important work to help our, settle our Afghan families. If you have the means to contribute, please think about them and other organizations. Congressman Crow, thank you. Thank you, Rai. Appreciate your leadership and continued service. Uh, and yes, we are going to go to a Tom Periello next, uh, the Executive Director of Open Society US. Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Crow, and to all of you, including my uh, former colleague, Representative Welch, who's been such a great advocate uh, for humanitarian work and veterans. For all of us who were able to spend time with the Afghan people over the last 20 years or before, we know that the warlords and the kleptocrats do not represent the real culture of real people. Um, it's a people of uh, committed to democracy, to human rights. Um, it's a people that inspired us, that protected us. Um, and to be honest, they're living heroes, but they're not gonna be living for long if we do not act today. We are talking about the people that stepped up to advance democracy, human rights, um, to stand up against some of the most corrupt and vicious figures on the planet. Um, they did it as allies with us, but allies of a universal mission that we at our best stand for. Uh, they are living today and what we do in the next two or three days, the next two or three weeks will determine uh, whether they live uh, to see this and help potentially write a new chapter for Afghanistan somewhere down the road. The asks are simple, keep the airport open, Keep it open, not just for the evacuation of American citizens, which is of course a priority, uh, but for all commercial flights, chartered flights, any effort philanthropic like ours, military or otherwise to get out as many people as we can, an effort to prioritize those who've taken the greatest risk through their work directly with the US government and standing up for women's rights, human rights and democracy. The airport must stay open, must stay open until all efforts to evacuate Afghan civilians uh, and our allies are out. We must continue to pressure allies around the world and ourselves uh, to accept more refugees and to not get stuck on the paperwork as so many of these representatives of mission have mentioned. Our mission in Afghanistan was to go after 
those who threatened our security, but it was also a mission based on the idea that certain values were universal, like the desire for human rights and democracy. That same idea of a universal humanity is at stake. Do you or do you not use every bit of force you have in order to protect the lives of innocent and vulnerable people? Many on this country, many on this call wore the uniform to protect those values. Many didn't wear the uniform, but fought in their own way with unbelievable courage. This is a test for us of our country's mission and our credibility now and in the future. But most importantly, this is one of those rare days where we can talk about saving lives and mean it without hyperbole. This is a chance to do the right thing. We need to use what we can to keep the airport open, to do everything we can to protect those who need to get to the airport uh, and get out. And we appreciate uh, all of those uh, including Representative Crow and others uh, for their leadership and asking that of this government right now, our government. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next, we will go to Sunil Varghese, Policy Director for the International Refugee Assistance Project. Uh, Sunil, over to you. Thank you, Representative Crow, and thank you to everyone that's joined us here. Um, this is uh, quite a, a tragedy and unavoidable catastrophe, but I guess, you know, what I want to make clear is that it is not too late, that as folks have said, we need to keep the airport open, not just for military flights, but troops need uh, to secure the civilian side of the airport so that we can get more commercial flights out to amplify efforts to get both Americans and Afghans out. We serve together and we should be able to leave together. Um, the, the International Refugee Assistance Project, IRAP, where I work, um, is I believe the only legal organization providing, uh, providing no cost legal representation for SIV applicants. We've been working with SIVs in Afghanistan for the better part of a decade. In 2016, we won a lawsuit to, uh, against the government um, where the a court decided that the SIV process was unreasonably delayed. But at this point, it is too late for processing and we need to get more Afghans on flights. And importantly, we need those Afghans to get onto flights to the United States. The, uh, DOD, the Defense Department in April and May signaled the ability to evacuate Afghans to the United States, but were, they were not given the order. It is our understanding over the last hour that DOD has approved a request to bring Afghans into bases in, in the US. And, we really need um, that to uh, to be robust. And Record, be recording in progress. Um, so I just want to leave you with that. We're, you know, like many, uh, we're receiving frantic text messages from our clients every hour. Uh, you know, a month, a month, more than a month ago, they were unable to get to Kabul. Now those that are in Kabul are unsure if they can safely get to the airport or not. Folks that had uh, received evacuation letters are now being told that those flights are being canceled. Um, there is a lot to do um, tomorrow and the day after, but immediately we need more flights out of the airport and we need those flights to have Afghans coming to the United States. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you for your leadership and your work. Uh, next, we will go to uh, Doug Livermore, a board member for No One Left Behind. Doug. I thank you, Representative Crow and everyone else that to be on this call today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm here today representing No One Left Behind. Uh, we're established in 2013. No One Left Behind has been the one organization solely focused on special immigrant visas, although historically we've been focused on two main efforts, one being the reformation of the actual SIV process itself. As was already discussed, it has been long, laborious, and very, very bureaucratic in nature, leading to all sorts of unfair delays and uh, rejections. Uh, additionally, No One Left Behind has been working for many years to provide resettlement and uh, financial support to Afghan and Iraqi SIVs and their families once they reach the United States. However, within over the, about the last year, starting in January of 2020, No One Left Behind has been focusing a lot of its recommendations and efforts on evacuation, uh, on the need for evacuations, particularly of our Afghan interpreters and their families. Uh, that said, you know, we are very, very thankful for all the bipartisan support we've been receiving uh, in our discussion in Congress. Uh, additionally, we've been working with the last three administrations, presidential administrations, to push for reforms and streamlining of the process. 
Uh, admittedly, there's still a lot of work to go. Uh, and you know, kind of echoing what's already been said here before, uh, we are very sorry to see us arrive at this tragedy we're at today. Um, particularly in the last several weeks, through our efforts to support evacuations, uh, No One Left Behind was providing funds from our very generous donors to purchase commercial airline tickets for uh, Afghan SIVs and their families that were already approved so they could come to the United States. Uh, additionally, we were providing legal support and interpreter support for the last group of SIVs that were evacuated to Fort Lee. Um, and we were really hoping that that was going to become the model. And we feel that that should become, or that should be the continuing model for how the United States government fulfills its obligations uh, to our, SI, our Afghan SIVs and their families. So just to really quickly uh, echo a lot of what was already said before, uh, what's first and foremost, what we see is most important based on our conversations is the security of the airport. Uh, we're receiving over the last several, di several days, we fielded untold thousands of phone calls and texts and emails from Afghans who are absolutely terrified, uh, you know, stuck between the, the barred gates of Kabul International Airport and Taliban that are circling the entire facility. Uh, it's imperative that our forces, both NATO and, and American, when they get on the ground, do everything they can to secure and push back the Taliban checkpoints and perimeter. Uh, additionally, as was already said, it's vitally important that we do everything in our power to maintain access to the airport, maintain that air bridge, the air, the air pipeline upon which uh, we're so committed to ensure the safe evacuation of not just the SIVs, but all of the Afghans that are in danger who have worked alongside the United States for so long. And then again, echoing what's been said before, there is both a moral imperative when Congress first uh, uh, passed the SIV law that was making a commitment to both the Afghan and the Iraqi SIVs that this was something that for their honorable service alongside our forces, we, we would take care of them. And that has also already been said, the, the national security imperative of ensuring that we follow through with these obligations, because not just the Afghans are watching. As we see, there's been a, so much conversation in the global sphere about what it means to be an ally of the United States. So our honor is absolutely at stake, but so is our national security. And then I'll just conclude by saying that in the last several weeks we've seen, or months we've seen a lot of progress as the State Department and DOD ramped up their efforts to assist with the SIVs and other Afghan visa programs. Uh, particularly, as you saw, the surging of, of uh, State Department personnel to Kabul and State Maine. Um, but we really, really, if we're going to save as many of our Afghan allies as possible, this will serious, to go back to the Dunkirk analogy, require all hands on deck for as long as it takes to get everyone out. Thank you again for your time and uh, really appreciate the support. Thank you, Doug. We appreciate uh, your leadership and your work and for joining us today. Uh, I, I want to take a moment and recognize a few folks who are joining me in person here in Colorado. I have Jennifer Wilson, the Executive Director of the International Rescue Committee of Denver, uh, Sohila Pariyar, uh, and Ashapula Sharifi, Afghan SIV recipients. Uh, we have Terry Clinton with the American Legion of Colorado, uh, Barbara Gre uh, Green, the State Commander of the VFW of Colorado, uh, and Steve uh, Shawness, uh, the Colorado Legislative Director, past State Commander as well. Thank you for all of your leadership. Uh, so our message is very simple and I wanna thank everybody who joined us and that is send the troops in and the resources and the combat power necessary to secure the air power, uh, airport and to secure it as long as is necessary to get the job done and to get American citizens out and to get our friends and partners out. Uh, there is a bipartisan coalition behind that. The American people are behind that because they know it's the moral thing to do they know it's the right thing to do, and they also know that it's in a U.S. national security interest to do it as well. Uh, that is our message. That is simple. We will continue to work night and day uh, for that mission. Um, uh, when I became an Army Ranger, I had to recite the Ranger Creed. And there's a stanza of that Ranger Creed that says, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. That was a lifetime promise. And I mean it, and it applies to our soldiers, it applies to American citizens who are currently in Afghanistan, and it applies to our Afghan friends and partners as well. 
Uh, so with that, uh, we're gonna um, take a couple of minutes here. I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes to take questions from folks and Meg Spencer and my team is going to be monitoring. I think if you raise uh, your hand, uh, she will put you in the queue. Meg? For all folks that are tuning in virtually and for press, if you wanna leave your comment in the Q&A section, we're happy to get you queued up. We'll give everyone a couple of minutes to get that started. While we're doing that, while we're queuing it up, um, uh, my friend uh, Peter Welch is on the line. I would like to give him uh, just a minute uh, to make uh, some comments because Peter has been uh, a champion Walk and has footsteps. So, Peter, if you have a couple of comments, we're waiting for. Well, thank you. We would love to hear from you. You know, it, this all boils down to the Ranger Creed. I mean, the question for the United States of America, it's very straightforward, it's very simple, and it's this Will the United States of America abandon? the people who helped our soldiers, our diplomats, our citizens, or will it come to their aid and assistance? That's our obligation. It's simple, it's straightforward, but by any means possible, by every means possible, we must as a country do everything we can to save all of those interpreters, all of those assistants, all of those women who helped our soldiers and helped the United States. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Representative Welch. And just for those who are participating in the Q&A, if you can include your outlet as well, that'll be helpful for making sure we get the right answers to the right folks. Okay, so Meg just said, uh, for those who are asking questions or in the queue, if you could include your, your outlet as well. All righty. So our first question is gonna be, one moment, please. From the Wall Street Journal, we have um, how many planes, do we have any information on how many planes could be flying into Afghanistan for P2s and people with SIV status um, if the airfields were secured? Um, if anyone would like to talk on that, and is the carrying capacity for each of those planes? If anyone has specifics, um, or if that's, we're able to talk about that. I do not, uh, for that question from the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if folks were able to hear uh, Meg repeating the question, but the question was about the number of planes and the carrying capacity of those, those planes. I do not have that information, that level of operational detail. I've not been provided that, uh, but I don't know if anybody uh, has more information uh, than I do. I can speak to that quickly, Representative. There, there are a range of planes and sizes. It depends uh, largely, uh, first and foremost, on what is permitted in terms of landing. So the first issue is, the security of uh, the airport itself and what the protocols are gonna be for chartered or commercial planes coming in. That's why it's so important uh, that the US government make sure to secure uh, the capacity for both commercial and charter landings. I think their planes ranging from 75 to 250, um, but a lot of that depends on which ones are available and willing to come in. So there's, there's a significant amount, and I can tell you from the philanthropic efforts that have happened, it's just not at the scale of what governments can provide, and the demand is, is astronomical. So I think, as many have said, the most important thing right now is to make sure that uh, not only the airport is secured and that these types of flights are allowed, but that also the U.S. government uh, commit to protecting that uh, even beyond AMSIT's departures uh, to the point that all of those who, who can. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jason. Mike Waltz. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can't. I want to answer the latter part of that on the P2 and, and, and P1. One of the things that, that I uh, am, am calling on state and the administration to do is, is on the one hand, we are grateful for rolling out the, that program in the last few weeks. On the other hand, uh, the requirement to go to a third country uh, and engage the UNHCR there, uh, I believe is onerous and unrealistic. And, uh, and, and pressing them to waive that requirement. Uh, there are NGOs still in Kabul. 
uh, that uh, could help process and the UN could even help process uh, there at, at Cabo Airport. So I, again, I think there's a number of things that state could do to streamline uh, this process. We made some progress with the Allies Act and that was, that was tremendous, but there's a number of other things uh, time is of the essence. And the P1, P2 requirement to get to Iran, Pakistan, or any of the other stands is one thing that I think uh, would make a, a big difference. Uh, just, just to Mike's point, I totally uh, agree with that. I do think we've made a little bit of progress in, in the sense that the administration has said in principle, they're willing to take uh, people in those categories to third countries to be processed later on. And, and uh, Secretary Albright mentioned uh, Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia, having offered uh, to take in uh, people in those categories uh, to, be, to be precise. So there, there is a place to take those people now. Uh, I think there's an argument for opening up a US territory uh, as well if we if we don't uh, have enough offers from third countries. But uh, yeah, the, the time to be processing paperwork in Afghanistan is past. We, we have a, and the State Department has a list of those Thank people. They have, they've got a list, so they, they know who they are. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next question, Meg. Our next question is coming from the New York Times. Um, members of Congress, including yourself and members of the Honoring Our Promises Working Group have been raising concerns for months about the Afghan refugee evacuation plan. How do you think um, the administration responded to those concerns? And if you can talk a little bit about how